Hello, thank you everyone for coming. <clears throat> I am Erica Jones and I work at Somerville Media Center, um, AKA SCAT or SCAT TV for those who remember our roots. Um, really excited about today, um, this idea for bringing everyone together literally just came to fruition over a beer one day as most good ideas do and we both felt the need to have more engagement with the community here and being both media centric organizations we wanted to know more about what issues were being covered were not being covered and it just made sense to to bring this together and what a great response and thank you all for taking the time out on a saturday <laughs> to come out and to talk about um, hopefully things that you are passionate about. Um, yeah, so where I work, uh, we are a close to 40-year-old organization based in Union Square. Um, we are a media arts, independent journalism uh, training space for youth to adults. And our, our main goal and mission is to really provide an accessible space for people to make media that they care about. Plain and simple, we have no agenda as an organization. We just want people to feel excited and, em and embrace their ideas so they can share it out via a podcast, a TV show, a documentary, um, whatever it is. And that is what we do, and that's why today is really important for us to be um, a, a partner with uh, Binge on this event. Um, recently, we hosted, in partnership with the Somerville Public Library, an exhibit which we have an art gallery in our, in our studio, and many, maybe some of you have come by for this exhibit, but it was a look at the small press publications from over the years. And it was essentially an archival timeline of the community news distributions that were created for the last like 40 years. And it was a really impressive thing to see where there were newsletters about cats that was a popular thing, I guess, people wanted to see more about back then. Um, radical newspapers, um, you know, multilingual newspapers. It was just a really beautiful display of, wow, look at the history of Somerville and, you know, what, how far we've come, how far uh, removed we are from some issues that we're not really addressing. Um, but it was just a really beautiful display of just, like, where we can be, and it was an encouraging just sort of reflection and um, applause to, to Somerville. And I know that there were some uh, people in the room here who started uh, the Somerville Community News, right? Um, and they have copies over here to, for, to, for you to admire and check out. And so anyways, that kind of just made me think about today and why we're here today. Um, and yeah, when we began partnering with Binge, we launched a regional news collaborative, which um, had its highs and lows, but the goal was to uh, create a platform for people to share multiple news segments around a, a targeted issue. And that then kind of came into fruition for us to uh, put together a community journalism workshop series, which is free and it's open to Somerville people, and we want you to take advantage of this, and hopefully, um, as an outcome of today, you might see the value in, in becoming um, part of this community journalism network. So we are trying to offer at least a space for you to take advantage um, of, of this training and, and collaborative environment. Um, so yeah, that's really kind of like one big goal. We're excited to listen to what everyone has to say. Um, and our wonderful interns here at Central Media Center are recording um, this and we'll share um, some, some media around. And with that, thank you for being here. We're super grateful. And I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Jason Premis. So thank you. Thank you, Erica. <clears throat> I am, I am Jason Pramus. I'm, uh, let's see, executive director and associate publisher of Dig Boston, which is the for-profit wing of our kind of mediaplex, we call it. And I'm the network director of the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, which is the nonprofit wing, obviously. So I'm going to give you the overview for today, and then I'll pass it off to Chris Ferrone, my colleague. Um, this summit is about Somerville talking to Somerville, about what local issues and happenings people feel aren't getting enough news coverage. And if there's a lot of stuff missing in the remaining area news outlets, as my colleagues and I believe is the case, then it is incumbent upon the community to organize for more news coverage. 
for better news coverage. Because if we want the United States to remain a democracy, then we need thorough news coverage of all significant political, cultural, and social developments in every city and town across the nation. So that we can all be informed participants in the mechanisms of collective decision making that, uh, that our government at every level and in many societal institutions as well still provides to one degree or another. Which doesn't mean that all news coverage and particularly news opinion and analysis has to agree on what's happening and on what the best way forward is in any given area of human endeavor. It's best if all news coverage doesn't agree on everything. It's best if we have sustained and lively debate on issues of the day, because that's what democracy means. Community discussion, debate, and collective decision making based on the best information that a news media and the service of democracy can provide across the political spectrum. For those of us who are journalists covering Somerville, it's our job to do everything we can to improve and expand that coverage and to work together with the local community to figure out how to stop its long, ugly slide to becoming a news desert, a place where there isn't, a, uh, isn't sufficient news coverage of issues and happenings in this city. Which is not to say that Somerville is a news desert now, but at least myself and the other journalists and community media producers that convene this summit are concerned that things are moving in that direction, and we believe that that's not acceptable. So all of the journalists in attendance today are here to listen to what you all have to say, and then network with you after we're finished with our formal program to essentially start production on a number of new articles about Somerville without delay. Hopefully together we can take a step along the road to a bigger, better, and more responsive local news media that Somerville residents can take real pride in, knowing that you all didn't wait for that media to fall out of the sky, but that you took action to rebuild the news media you need while there was still time to act. That said, uh, let's just run through our very simple agenda. After we're done with our brief introductory remarks here, we'll bring up uh, participating journalists who are over here to quickly introduce themselves. Then we'll start calling up folks to speak about some of the issues and happenings that they think need more news coverage. We'll alternate between representatives of our many co-sponsoring organizations and those individuals who just signed up to speak. Every speaker gets two minutes. When speakers come up to the mic, that mic... They should say their name and where they live or work in Somerville and then move on to the rest of their remarks. Our timekeeper will show each speaker a card when they've got 30 seconds left and another card when they've got 10 seconds left. When time is up, the MC, uh, me or Chris or Erica, will thank the person who just finished and call up the next person. And we're just going to keep doing that until 1.55 p.m. and then move on to informal networking for about half, half an hour, at which time we'll ask everyone to move out of the hall so we can clean up and get out of the once staff's hair. Uh, before anyone speaks, I would ask you all to take a look at the handout that my colleagues and I um, left on each of your seats. It basically lays out how you can go about getting a journalist interested in your ideas for potential news stories. Please pay particular attention to the list of tests for what kinds of story ideas journalists typically consider newsworthy. That is, ideas that are worthy of being written up as news articles. That should help you shape your remarks with an eye toward getting one of our journalists interested in the ideas you're speaking about. Finally, let me just mention our ground rules for today's discussion. The ground rules for speakers are, number one, be nice, right? Okay. <laughs> number two, speak for no more than two minutes. Four, if somebody needs a translator. And if somebody does need a translator in at least Spanish or French or Creole, let, let us know and we can translate your, your remarks. Uh, and number three, stay on topic, which again is issues and happenings in Somerville that need more news coverage. The ground rules for audience members are one, be nice, yes, and two, don't interrupt speakers. Uh, but you know, a bit of clapping or cheering is fine. Um, that's the basic deal. Thanks for everyone to coming, uh, for coming today. And now a few words by my colleague, Chris Ferrone. Thanks. This is great. I think you all need another round of applause for being here on a, on a Saturday. This is unbelievable. I, will be, I really will be quick. Uh, my name is Chris Ferrone. I am um, also a co-publisher and editor of Dig Boston, and I, I hope a lot of you know us. We put more than 10,000 newspapers in your city every week, and we're, we're based right on the border. Um, but, you know, I, I, I know a few of you in this room since my days at the Boston Phoenix. Um, in my last days at the Boston Phoenix, we were... The, the day that it got shut down, we were six months into uh, a, a major investigation into a myriad, a lot of things in Somerville. Uh, we ended up taking that to the dig. Some of you know that work. Uh, but my point is that this stuff is, this stuff takes a lot. You know, when we went to the dig, when I, when I went to the dig after the Phoenix closed, the dig didn't really have the kind of budget to do that kind of deep investigative reporting. And it's actually 
this city and, and that work was one of the major inspirations for uh, what we call BINGE, the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. I could talk about that for days, but I'll make it quick. The BINGE um, puts resources where they aren't. We help uh, outlets, including The Dig, do the kind of stories that they can't afford to do otherwise. That's why we're here. Uh, so just a few things, let's see. So first of all, I just want to stress again, I know Erica mentioned it, there are follow-up workshops. So I kind of, you know, I'm Mr. Community Media, I hate the whole like, these people are reporters, these people aren't. I know a lot of people dabble, blog, we have workshops. So this is, we really trying to be as inclusive as possible here, and those are gonna be fun. Uh, so check out uh, Erica about that. Also, we'll, we'll put the link on the Facebook page for this. Um, I want to say that, you know, we have not given up coverage of Somerville. We're going to invest this year uh, a little bit more than we have. But we've done stuff over the years. But, hey, I've trained like four people to cover Somerville who then got priced out. Um, one's living in Portland. I just spoke with her the other day. I mean, this is like, uh, so this is, we're trying to really just kind of build that, that base here. Um, uh, and finally, this is real. You know, this is not lip service. This is not fraudulent engagement. This isn't when your television news station puts up a survey that they don't even care about the results. There will be stories generated out of this. Um, I mean that. Uh, so when that, on that note, journalists, can you uh, arise? Arise, come up. Come up. First, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Julia Taliesin. Um, I am the recently appointed um, journalist editor everything for the Somerville Journal. Um, I started at the end of October and I've been working hard ever since then. I'm a recent graduate of Simmons College, um, so I'm young and I know I have a lot to learn, but I've been putting in the hours and doing my homework to make sure that I can serve you all the best that I can. And that's why I'm here today. So I'm really excited to hear everything you have to offer us. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Rena Carrison. I am the editor in chief at Scout Somerville and Scout Cambridge. Um, so at Scout we cover Great. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> My name is Rena Carrison. I'm the editor in chief at Scout Somerville and Scout Cambridge. We cover everything in both of those cities. Um, we do some news coverage, but we have a bigger focus on features. We love profiling people, um, but we definitely are interested in news as well. So, pretty much anything you can come to us for. Uh, hello, um, my name's Dan Atkinson. I am a freelance journalist. I've written stuff for Chris, write stuff uh, in Boston. Uh, and in terms of Somerville, I was the editor of the Somerville Journal uh, for four years, 2012-2016. Uh, I did a lot of reporting in the city, still have a lot of interest in the city, particularly around development stuff. So that's where I am, and uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Lynn Doncaster. Uh, I've written for The Dig Arts and Culture, wrote a story last year about the history of the Davis Square statues, and I'm really interested in covering more stories that cover the history of Somerville. I'm a lifelong resident. Um, also interested, I, I make zines and do other quirky, other kinds of storytelling, so I'm looking for other outlets that are looking for things that are not as news investigative, but um, like human interest stories and arts. Hi, I'm Bill Marks, the editor of The Art Shoes. It's an online arts and culture journal. We've been around here for 11 years. Um, I do a certain amount of coverage of arts in Somerville, although we do a lot of books, films, and so forth. We go across the spectrum in terms of what we cover. But I'm interested in covering um, arts and culture events in Somerville. I have over 60 freelance writers. I like working with young writers, particularly budding critics and reviewers. I think it's a valuable craft to learn. So if you're interested in covering material in Somerville or anywhere, frankly, or doing a book review, film review, and so forth, then talk to me because um, I'm both interested in generating stories from Somerville, but I'm also interested in cultivating writers and journalists from Somerville who could write for the arts views, particularly uh, reviews and criticism and commentaries that come with some attitude. Thanks. Hello, my name is Mark Levy. I do a website called Cambridge Day, and I'm here because the premise intrigued me, but also because it's impossible to cover Cambridge without sort of crossing over into Somerville. It's a very permeable border, and frankly, Somerville does a lot of things better than Cambridge. So uh, I'm really just here to sort of watch and listen, but if anyone does want to talk to me, it would be uh, fantastic to hear from you and learn what Cambridge Day can do for Somerville. Thank you. I'm Sarah Betancourt. I'm with Commonwealth Magazine. I was with uh, Writing for Dig since 2013 until recently. 
Um, I do a lot of investigative reporting and public policy reporting, but as someone who's spent the past 13 years in the area, um, I'm really interested in hearing from you what issues you think are most important in Somerville, and not just in Somerville, but those in Somerville that are case examples of things that are reverberating across the Commonwealth. Um, I write a lot about immigration, um, about health care, and I'm hoping to write about a few other kinds of things. So if you want to reach out to me, um, I will be right there, and I'm sure we'll talk later as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dan Kaufman. Uh, I'm a freelancer. Uh, I was born in Somerville, but have been away for a while, so I'm interested in uh, getting back to, to my roots. Um, I'm interested in covering local politics, uh, changes in housing and public funding, um, and activist groups on both the far left and the far right. Thanks. Um, forgive me. Um, so I run the Wonderland. My name is Greg Cook. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, <laughs> my well, Wonderland is sort of it's a it's a it's about arts and culture and activism and sort of where they cross. So it's often socially engaged arts, but also sort of the 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 spectacle of activism and then the meaning of activism. And so. That's sort of what I do. I'm, I'm also involved in Somerville in organizing festivals and art things here. I, I do art myself, so I'm deeply involved in uh, these things, both as kind of a journalist, but also as somebody personally engaged with these issues and trying to make things in this area. So thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Cole Rosengren. I'm a Somerville resident here in a variety of capacities. My day job is as the senior editor of a trade publication called Waste Dive. We cover the US waste and recycling industry, but locally, I've uh, written for Binge and Dig. We did a long-form investigative piece last year about recycling labor issues in the Boston area. Also DJ with Boston Free Radio, so uh, here in that capacity. And finally, with the Society of Professional Journalists New England chapter. Uh, quick plug, we have our regional conference coming up at Northeastern University, April 5th and 6th. We'd love to see you there. Hello, my name is Sydney Wertheim. I'm an intern at Dig Boston. Um, I'm going to be holding up the time card, so I'm very excited to hear everything you guys have to say. <laughs> Hi, my name is Olivia Master Simone. I'm also an intern at Dig Boston and a student at Northeastern studying journalism, um, mainly focused in arts and culture reporting, specifically music, dance, and visual arts. So I'd love to write some pieces for you guys. Thank you. I'm Lynx Mitchell. I'm a freelance multimedia journalist, and I like to report on issues of disability, disability politics. I do mainly audio storytelling and written articles, and I also like uh, human interest and profiles. Thank you. Hi, we're from the Community Action Agency of Somerville. Um, I'm going to let Kay talk first, and then I'm going to cut in, and then... Guillermo's going to sum I'll, it up. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to summarize and uh, and direct it, some call to action. clean it up. <laughs> right, time's running. Okay. Hi, my name is Kate Byrne, um, and I live at 33 Oak Street in Somerville. Um, I'm the treasurer for the board of the Community Action Agency of Somerville. Um, we came into existence in 1981. Our mission is to end poverty in Somerville, which is kind of a big mission. Um, but we do that through working... Um, with our Head Start families, um, which Fran will talk about. Um, we have a program right now that's going on that's helping low-income uh, people do their taxes um, called the VITA program. It's at our main office in, in Union Square. Um, we also have just started a food pantry there. We also do um, work with um, our homeless prevention program, which works with people who are at very high risk of being homeless. They, um, we have advocates that go to court with people and help people try to resolve their issues with their with their um, landlords. Um, so we've got a big we've got a big mission. I'm on the uh, board for the Head Start program. We run the program in Somerville and Cambridge. Um, we have. Vacancies for, we do 275 children, and we give them all kinds of resources, anything the family needs. We don't just take care of the kids that are in this class, but we take care of the kids that, their siblings, and the parents. Um, I saw so what I'm saying, and I'm also a client, and I think I will turn it over now. <laughs> Thank you, friend. So, in summation, we're trying to eliminate the causes of poverty in Somerville. We try our best to empower low-income residents, and the most immediate pressing thing we can do is with the VITA program, it's free for low-income residents to maximize their tax returns. 
Not every single resident of Somerville can live without a tax return. In fact, some of them depend on it. So if you know someone, please shout it out, let them know, contact with us, or go to castsomerville.org, or Google Community Action Agency of Somerville, or reach me, Fran, or Kate, anytime at, at the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you. One other quick thing. We have uh, vacancies still on the board, if anybody would be interested in joining us. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kenya Alfaro. I'm the development associate at the Welcome Project. We are an immigrant nonprofit based in the city of Somerville, but we work with immigrant families throughout the greater Boston region. I'm going to read off some of the notes that I have so I don't forget what I wanted to say. Um, I think the broad thing that in some of that news coverage that we would like um, to be covered is uh, getting to be honest about some of the issues that many immigrant families are facing here in the city of Somerville. Um, I think as a very liberal city, sometimes we don't focus on some of the bad things that are happening within our city, especially um, things that are affecting immigrant families. Um, for example, inequities in education, the stories that we hear from many family members about, um, or even our students, about different discrimination or acts of racism that they're hearing themselves or facing themselves. Um, opportunities for a younger journalist um, that they want to be are excited about journalism, they want to be writing as well, and they may not see that access because of maybe the, the, the color of their skin or who they are, or maybe their language barrier. Um, some of the other things that we are also seeing and sometimes hearing about and maybe want to have more uh, conversation about um, is centering the voices of immigrant families that are often not um, centered. Um, so for example, though we may be hearing a lot of the stories, um, it would be really great for those voices to also be centered within the news um, to hear what it is that they want changes. So if they're looking for some changes in specific uh, locations, that, let's say in East Somerville, more greenery, if they're looking for more family spaces, then those voices should be the ones that are centered and not necessarily the outer community or us ourselves as an organization. Um, and I think one of the last things is uh, kind of uh, healthcare access. Uh, for many immigrants, um, and healthcare access is very broad as well. What is healthcare look within this city? What does it look if we're talking about environmental health and if we're talking about environmental racism that often affects many underrepresented groups, uh, people of color, and immigrant families, families themselves? That's kind of all I have. Thank you. One point five billion dollars, fifteen acres. 2,400,000 square feet over 15 years. It deserves some coverage. It's gotten some. It needs more. I'm talking about Union Square redevelopment. I'm the co-chair of the Union Square Neighborhood Council, but my original involvement was through Union United which is a coalition of organizations, trade unions, and neighborhood groups. But the primary group were the Welcome Project, CAS, Community Action Agency of Somerville, and the Somerville Community Corporation. Union United's been in existence for five years. We have been in the street as much as we've been in the halls of decision making and we appreciate the coverage that we've gotten. Um, we are in the midst of negotiations with a developer from out of town, from Chicago, that stands to make millions of dollars of, of profit. It's time for some of all to get a piece of the pie. Jobs, housing, that's affordable to long-term residents. We're tired of families having to leave. These are the stories that should be told, the individual ones and the group ones. We appreciate whatever more you can do for us in the future. Thank you. Lynn Doncaster, I'm up again because in addition to being a writer and an artist, I'm on the development team at Somerville Homeless Coalition. Uh, Ho Coalition runs two shelters, uh, a 16-bed adult shelter and five, uh, a shelter that can serve five families. Um, we address the problems of homelessness, near homelessness, and hunger in our community. Um, one of the issues that's come up this year is uh, 
our Project Soup Food Pantry, which last year served 900 households in Somerville, providing them with groceries and other essentials. In, since the start of 2009, we've had 60 new households sign up for services at Project Soup. Most years, we get 100 in a calendar year. And we think that this need for uh, food and for assistance is in part due to the government shutdown. People's food stamp benefits um, were changed, the schedule was changed. Um, last year, through housing assistance, we kept 72 families from becoming homeless. Uh, we always want to increase that. Um, we need coverage of our events. People know about the road race in October, that's in Davis Square. Uh, we have a gala coming up in the spring. Um, just uh, talk to me if you're interested in um, talking about any of the services that we offer. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Chris Duan. I live over on Beacon Street, and first off, it's humbling to get to address this group. This is amazing. You're all amazing. Um, I got radicalized about a year and a half ago when they cut down all the trees on Beacon. Um, I started organizing and writing letters and talking to people and making friends, and uh, the news, the news here is that the city has just sent a demand letter for $38,000 to the contractor who did that to us. And That took a hell of a lot more work than it, need, than it should have, right? Also, we are writing because of this momentum. Apparently, this is something people are passionate about. We looked at the data. We have lost approximately 10% of the trees in the city last year. Between GLX, the high school, the various street projects, you know, and none of these is like a maniac just running around with a chainsaw. This is the way the city does things. So last week, um, Thursday, we introduced, Mark uh, Niedergang and JT Scott, introduced an entirely new tree protection ordinance that will provide an organization that will allow us to coherently protect city trees, state trees, and trees on private property. The news there, I would love it if that was a community discussion so we have effective, sensible, well-balanced legislation. I would love to get it out far and wide that we're having that conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Mary Mangan, Winter Hill Neighborhood Association. Our mission is to bring together diverse residents of Winter Hill to protect and improve upon the things we love about our neighborhood, have a say in the future of the neighborhood, and staying informed, informing others, and building unity among our neighbors. Uh, we've been meeting monthly for about the past two years. We've organized tenants' rights workshops, neighborhood cleanups, vacant lot takeovers, potlucks, meetings with elected officials and candidates, and other events that enable neighbors to get involved with issues that impact our lives. Some meetings are agenda-based and you know issues, but others are purely social gathering because we want to generate community um, conversations as well. Um, we've got a bunch of things planned for 2019, including a screening of the film The Staircase, about the staircase at the Mystic in March, and other tenants' rights workshops are coming up in the fall. Typically, our meetings are the first Wednesday of the month at a neighborhood community room. You can check out our forum or uh, Facebook for uh, the location and the time. Um, our topics of interest that we got from our members, um, more analysis of development trends and players. Who are these companies and investors that are cashing in on the endless stream of condo conversions? Who are the property owners sitting on huge vacant lots and vacant storefronts? I've had three people here ask me about the star market. Um, who are the developers landing all the big projects? Uh, more coverage of City Hall beyond the, beyond the city's own press releases. What's happening in the schools? Are they actually improving outcomes for students with the most barriers, or are schools just shifting to more affluent demographics? Uh, we want to connect and align with other neighborhood or issue groups doing similar things on common issues, and it's hard to know who and where this is, so maybe this newsletter would be great. Um, uh, reaching and engaging renters is particularly hard for us. We have the same homeowners showing up for most of our meetings, but that's why we had the tenants' rights workshop. Um, urban environment issues are of concern to us and urban health issues that are uh, more specific to city living. Um, the Resistat was a great idea initially, but we never get beyond the city marketing information anymore. We aren't digging into the data on... Oh. <laughs> on restaurant inspections, licenses, health department stuff, recreation department events, all kinds of city stuff. Some of it's good, some of it might not be, but we're not hearing any of that um, uh, besides budget and zoning and car break-ins at the Resistat meetings. So that's us, Winter Hill Neighborhood Association. I'm Allison Schultz. I'm an artist at the Brick Bottom Building. And I'd like to actually talk about like one of the issues of news coverage or lack of news coverage is that there just seems to be an inability to connect the dots anymore. So when we think like with the GLX project happening, we've all like heard about like the bridge closing, the 
you know, the bridge closing at Ball Square, the bridge closing at McGowan, like over at Washington Street. But nobody actually ever see, shows a regional chart of what's going to happen with these bridge closings and let's Charlestown, which is happening simultaneously, the Rutherford Avenue project, which is going to happen, and the opening of the casino. So the, the inability to see a bigger picture is eliminated when Somerville is not being reported on. And then for a very specific thing is I'd like to talk about the GLX. Um, they had a meeting over at East Somerville, the school, up where they basically released the design. It was very informal, like stations, you'd walk around. And I haven't seen anything really reported about the designs. And what with the design build, We've lost the ability as a community to have our voice be part of the process. They, you know, are off designing, they're off building, and then they basically let us know what's going to happen. So one of the things I thought when I was at the design building, particularly while I was looking at the East Somerville Station, it's the most poorly engineered from a practical usability standard that anybody could ever come up with. Yep, if you're in East Somerville, you would walk a two city block ramp because it has to be, they do not want to have elevators or escalators there for um, the ADA um, accessibility reasons. So the incline of the ramp is now two city blocks down away from the busy street. A blind, you know, you're walking away from life, like from safety, as, as safe as the bridge underneath Washington ever, Street ever gets, but you're walking a two city blocks away into a like dead zone that will have two call stations, you know, and then at the end of the ramp, you are gonna do a sharp left turn, which means a blind spot. And at the end of that little like area, you enter the community path where you are gonna have to walk across the community path, which is I assume having bicyclists in both ways. You have to walk across this to reach the entrance of the, um, Ramp. And I immediately looked in and said, why can't they have the community path be cantilevered so it's to the right of the ramp? Why does the ramp have this sharp angle? Like, is there no safety involved? Like, it's amazing to me that this is like what, how our money, and it's a lot, it's a ton of money that Somerville had to actually be ransomed for. Our money, like, so, I have 10 seconds. My, I'll end my rant there, but I feel like sorry, that sorry. there needs to be analysis of the design and because the community voices, I write my letters, I write like, you know, I do the response, I do go to meetings and things like that, but without like an actual news articles and having this out in a larger public view, it's very difficult to actually see that there's any way to actually initiate change and come up with a better engineered solution. Thank you. Thanks. This is awesome having all these folks together and definitely needed. My name is Justin Mailing. I live on Marshall Street in Somerville, just down the hill. And as the Green Line Extension representative to the community working group for the Gilman Square Station area, I get to meet a lot of my neighbors. We've also had a lot of conversations about station design. Gilman Square actually doesn't have direct access to the Gilman Square Station. Happy to talk to folks about that <laughs> afterwards. Um, <clears throat> but in getting to know neighbors, one of the things that we realize is that Gilman Square, some people don't even know that Gilman Square exists. Um, I've had a few people, I've had to show them a map and remind them that the two gas stations and the empty warehouse is what we're talking about. Um, but it's also going to get a GLX station. It's going to get, the Holman's building is going to come down and get replaced at the end of the station construction. There's going to be a lot of development that happens in that area, and it's also piggybacked on Central Hill. There's really going to be a, a, an upswell of development and just endless opportunities for some really cool stuff. And one of the things that I found when the uh, auto mechanic next door to my house sold for $2.6 million to a developer who wants to put a four to six story building in there, I realized that that was really close to my back door. Um, it's part of what got me interested in getting to know my neighbors and getting the community active in being involved with this development that happens. 
So about last March, a few of us got together and we formed the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association. We meet the first Monday of every month uh, at 2 Richdale Avenue. I'm happy to talk to folks more about that afterward. Um, it's an interesting situation in which we already had the Winter Hill Neighborhood Association, of which I'm also a member, they're awesome. Um, but you've got Central Hill, part of Ward 1, uh, Ward 3, Ward 4, all coming together in Gilman Square. We needed a voice that was collective for that neighborhood. Um, it's been a great year. We've done some interesting stuff. We had a pretty substantial block party that people talk about. We're hoping to do another one. Coming in March, we're going to have our first birthday party at um, <coughs> Winter Hill Brewing Company. Um, we were able to advocate with the city and GLX and our elected officials in order to get the pedestrian bridge open on um, School Street. And we're really working to be active with neighbors in the community that are engineers and architects to have the community at the table with developers in the city in developing Gilman Square. And we hope that folks live in the neighborhood join us. So not just journalists, but anybody that lives in the neighborhood, come find me and I'd love to talk with you more. Hi, I'm Ellen Reisner from the Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership. It's great to see all these people here. Um, we, got, we were founded around 2003 by community residents concerned about getting the Green Line extension brought here and we've been working on it since then. I, wanna, I don't want to repeat everything that's been said because I think the comments that have been made are really important. The design issues are really v of great concern, not just for now, but for the long term of the city of Somerville. Particularly, you know, um, the safety, the accessibility, and in Union Square, not only accessibility, but attractiveness. So I don't want to belabor this. We've moved on a little bit although we're still very engaged in all of these issues, to exploring the health effects of noise and air, air pollution caused by traffic. We've been working very closely for over 10 years with Tufts University Schools of Engineering and Medicine and community partners from the Welcome Project in Chinatown. We work really closely with Chinatown because they have the same problems. Um, and we've been working on research that has proven the effects of this pollution. Right now, we actually are working on a project with the city of Somerville to look at how to get better ventilation systems in the newer housing that's going up near highways. We want people to participate in this because we feel like we get called all the time and said, is this a, is this a safe way to build a new building? And is it going to be good? We don't want to have to do it building by building. We want to have some guidelines for the city. We want people to be aware that we have some choices to make and ways to deal with making improvements to the quality of life. We all live near busy roadways. We all want to live in safe places. Um, obviously, reducing the number of vehicles traveling on our streets is a big thing, but that's not going to happen instantaneously. It's going to take a long time for that to happen. So we want people to be aware of our research. If people are interested, they can go to the STEP website, Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, or to the community. It's called CAFE, C-A-F-E-H. We have a lot of our research posted and information about our current projects. And I really hope that the media will take a look at this because um, we feel it's really important. It's not just Somerville. I mean, our neighbors in, Chi in uh, Charlestown are building housing right next to Rutherford Avenue near the I-93. Um, it's happening now in Medford as well. So these are issues that community people need to pay attention to, and I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. As many of you know, Somerville is the victim of a hostile takeover by developers who have been streaming into Somerville, um, whose motive, obviously, is to make money. Um, and they are changing the face of our town. The mayor still invites development and says every chance he gets that if you want to build, come to Somerville. Um, this development has fueled runaway real estate prices. So that 17.8% of Somerville renters 
pay 50% or more of their income on rent. Um, there has been and there continues to be wonderful work around affordable housing, but there has not been nearly enough around market intervention. We need to stop the raging locomotive that is running us down. This is not a story. This is an investigative reporting series, and I hope one of you, or more, would like to do that. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ted Serota. I'm from Artisans Asylum. I'm on the board of directors. If you haven't heard of us, and if you don't know what we do, our mission is to enable people to make whatever they want to make, uh, to learn from each other, and to teach each other. And we want to provide space for people to be able to do this, and that's kind of our main goal. And we're right off of uh, Somerville Ave, right on Tyler Street. And we have a couple of pretty big issues that we're facing all the time. Uh, one of the biggest ones is just access to space for our artists. Uh, no two people at Artisans do the same thing. and. So we have a lot of uh, diversity in kind of the setups that we need. Somerville has a huge opportunity to kind of help us out with that. There's, you know, schools, there's old buildings, warehouses that we could, you know, inhabit and create our, create our things. Uh, so that's our, that's our kind of number one concern. Our number two concern is just getting out there, getting like people know, getting people to know who we are, what we do, uh, getting people in the door. And I think that with kind of your help, uh, we can hopefully get the word out more. We've definitely been doing that a lot more this past year. Um, but yeah, the, I think that we have the potential to help with a lot of the issues that have brought up, uh, that have been brought up tonight, today, during the day. Uh, I think we have a lot of creative thinkers, a lot of creative people, and you know, artists in residencies maybe have people, uh, well, I don't know. I'm probably gonna live in a van in the next three years. Like, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm not, like, uh, I'm not like that hopeful. But we're gonna stay here. We're here for the long run. Keep us, keep us in your mind. Uh, and it'd be great to have some of our artists featured. It'd be great to have you guys come down, take a look. I could talk about it all day but I would not be able to even capture kind of 1% of the amazing stuff that happens. And uh, it'll, it'll make everybody feel better, honestly. Like, I feel like there's a lot of problems, a lot of issues in the world. Sit down, make something, like, you'll feel so much better. And you'll make the world a little bit better. So please come visit. We're close. Uh, I'm also, yeah, all right, that's it. Uh, it's 10 Tyler Street, uh, so right off of Somerville Ave. We're right next to Market Basket. The uh, envelope making factory. Yes, the old envelope making factory. We've done wonders with it. So, <laughs> literally. And Kamara here. Um, I come from Hanson Street in Duck Village. I, um, <laughs> I um, am on the Union Square Neighborhood Council Board, and I would like to invite you to our next meeting, February 20th, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Public Safety Building. Um, we're working on everything that you're talking about here right now. Any project that you have, come bring it to us. We will help you, and we need your input, and we need your help. Uh, we're working with development for affordable, really affordable housing, and jobs and training, sustainability, green space. So we're working on a lot of things. So please come. And I am also a member of Union United. If you need a voice, please join Union United. It's um, some place that you can have a voice. It's organized, and it fights for the right things. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, excuse me for my hoarse voice. Um, my name is Heather Belchunas, and I am um, one of the coordinators over at Vernon Street Studios. And, um, and I've also been a part of the creative landscape for a number of years. If um, anyone hasn't... Um, 
not familiar with Vernon Street Studios. Uh, it is conveniently located right down the street on Central Street in the old in the uh, in, in the Rogers Film Building. Um, we have been in existence for over 40 years. We're one of the oldest um, artist buildings here in Somerville. And we have over 100 artists uh, in the building, and it's very exciting. And uh, some of them are emerging artists, and some are um, working professionals, teachers, uh, hobbyists. We have all kinds of different people in our building, and it's very exciting. Um, one of the things that I did want to talk to you uh, today is um, we participate in open studios twice a year, one hours on our own, and also one is also going to be coming soon for uh, Somerville Open Studios as a greater collective of all the wonderful artists that are here in Somerville. Uh, one of the and and like in in addition to my other hats that I wear um, uh, often is um, sometimes uh, there are events that are one-off events that are very exciting that get journalists very um, engaged um, quirky events like maybe there's a cat festival going on in Somerville or there's um, or there's something like oh there's um, there's a fluff festival or there's um, or or there's something that's uh, or there's a ice cream showdown. Those are all very exciting. There's all very one-off events. But when it's something that comes to open studios, they're perennial events. And when you do press releases, you have a habit of kind of generating the same kind of information. And maybe this is a conversation for during the networking time, but I'd like to get feedback on what, in, what excites you. What would make open studios a little bit more dynamic what is it um is it refreshing press releases is it highlighting artists um because right now one of the dilemma artist buildings are kind of facing right now is there's so many open studios right now there's a open studios every single week and um somerville is special we have a lot of artist buildings i mean i'm i'm speaking for my own building um but we have joy street we have brick bottom bad oyster and some of these studios only um showcase their work only once a year and that's for somerville open studios so um and i think there's an oversaturation with the open studios kind of format and how with your help, how can we make that more dynamic again? And and uh, is it can, is it something that we can highlight individual artists and maybe do a studio visit? Do like do, do a press studio visit where you can come in and maybe do like a press open house just so you can see and and capture some of the artist stories um, uh, during the studio visit, like prior to the event. Would that excite you? So I think what I'm looking for is just like for feedback on on how we can help you make the story more dynamic. Uh, it's not just a story about just the particular event, but just of our creative community, our artists. Uh, we have over 400 artists here in Somerville, and um, they're all doing, in each, and each artist is doing unique, wonderful work. And I think that really needs to kind of be showcased, not just here in my building, but again, just just throughout the community. And, and, and I think what they're doing is exciting. And it's not just like pretty paintings, but some of them are also doing community activism too. They're engaging the public through, um, through the social response to the political uh, landscape, social landscape, in addition to uh, trying to uh, sell their work. So um, I look forward to networking with you and uh, or, or having a conversation a little bit later. And thank you once again for being a part of this. This is really exciting. And I think this is the start of a really wonderful conversation about how we can make not just our creative community more dynamic, but also on a social political landscape too. Thank you. We just want to take a quick moment to recognize uh, some of the local and state uh, political leaders in the room for taking the time to come out today. Um, we have, and I'm sorry, I'm just only identifying those who I who I see. Um, Senator uh, Pat Jalen, thank you for being here. Representative Denise Provo is in the room as well. And uh, city councilor, because that is what we are saying now. Uh, <laughs> Mary Jo Rossetti in the room as well. And then, is there Bill White? How can I, I'm sorry, Bill. City councilor Bill White. 
And I know others wanted to be here, but they had other um, engagements, but they um, did contact us for on the city councilor level at least. So thank you again. Round of applause for being here. I'm Polly Pook from the Brick Bottom Art Association, but, or the Artists Building, but I'm not here to talk about arts. Um, I'm here to talk about the community path and inner belt. Um, and looking at your list of tests for newsworthiness, I hit the first nine. So not bad. And it might even be kind of heartwarming if you look at it a certain way. Um, we'll see. So um, I'm going to start with a shock and awe. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that um, we are all in favor of the community path. And as you know, the, um, there were six options on the GLX contract. And the fifth one was to extend that community path from the East Somerville Washington Street Station over to North Point. And that's great. Everybody would like to have that. Um, the problem is what they've actually designed. And I think people are completely unaware of what they've designed. They have designed something that runs nearly a mile long with no exits, no access between them. It runs 50 feet up into the air over the BET bridges. Um, so it's gale force winds up there with only 10 foot cyclone fen fences on either side to protect you. And there are emergency call boxes every thousand feet. Okay. So um, we um, have created an alternate plan and we've, when we presented this to them and what, and this has been approved of by the Friends of the Community Path. Um, and what this does, and I've handed out this packet to as many press people as I could find, and if anybody wants one, let me know. On the second two pages of it are the pictures of their plan and our plan. <coughs> and what this does is it <coughs> breaks it up into three parts. There's two access points. Um, one, it, then their parks could be built at each, resting places. Um, it runs, oh, most of it is about zero to 20 feet up above the ground. Um, it, then it goes up to 43 feet, but only for about a quarter of a mile. And it's a gentle, it goes from 20 to 40 and back down. Um, and most importantly, it connects to the inner belt. And it means that everybody in the inner belt, pedestrian and bicyclist now, <coughs> as well as a future inner belt T station, could connect to the community path. Whereas the proposed path by the GLX constructors blocks any future access to an eventual T station in the inner belt. Um, we have presented this to, uh, we've met with the, and by we, by the way, I, I was a design working group and a working group city appointed member for the GLX, and I've worked with the GLX for some time, and I represent the Brick Bottom District. Um, and some community members and I presented this to um, the MBTA, the state, the city, and some GLXC engineers all in the same room. They asked us not to involve the press or not to involve Friends of the Community Path to really have a working brainstorming meeting. They completely agreed that this was entirely feasible um, and that they did not disagree in their language that the other one was not community friendly. But the GLXC just want to have a path that connects, you know, the straightest line between two points and be done with it. And I'm asking the press for some help in getting some traction on the story. First of all, letting the community know about it. And second of all, putting some pressure on the city and the MBTA to try to um, take a look at this. Because as, a, as community members, this is going to be a path that only the bravest bicyclist is going to zoom up and down. Um, and as a taxpayer, we are completely blocking any development. You know, here's a real opportunity to include the Interbelt. Um, and from Interbelt connection, not just to Somerville, but to North Point and to Cambridge. Um, and so we really need to kind of, we need to be much more long-sighted about this. Um, and so I have these, if anybody would like, with my contact information. See, I already read those notes. Thank you. I'm Robert Goss. I'm, uh one of the founders of the Brick Bottom Artist Building in Somerville. Uh, how many people have been there, either for open studios or gout? You know, whoa, okay. that's great, yeah. Huh? Good to my place? Oh, yeah. that's even better. <laughs> uh, we started this uh, 
back in 86, we had two years of construction and demolition before we moved in on April Fool's Day of 1988. Uh, a good number of the original members are still living there. Something that we've tried to explain to GLX people and others is there are families there. There are children who've grown up there. Uh, and there's a whole new group of children being born there. Well, not literally born there, but growing up there. Uh, as an aside, I'm a grandpa as of 18 days ago, so that's a plus. <laughs> if it were my choice to be up here, I think a lot of the topics we've talked about, affordable housing, homelessness, gentrification of Union Square stuff, are pretty important to me, but right now, you know, my <coughs> goal is to talk about Brick Bottom and the live workspace that it is. It is live workspace, uh, which not everyone is aware of. Uh, I remember talking to a GOX representative at a meeting and saying, we have families here, we have children. He said, oh, we had no idea. They just assumed it was a bunch of artists hanging out there. And, you know, these are people's homes. If we were 150 houses, we would be treated very differently by the city than being a vertical community. Uh, and because there was so much press in the beginning about Brick Bottom, much more than we get now, our first open studios had 5,000 people at it. Uh, it was incredible. We do an annual open studios every year, the weekend before Thanksgiving. We're also involved with Somerville Open Studios. I think there's about, unfortunately, about 12 artists will be open this May for the Somerville Open Studios. Uh, the website is brickbottom.org. We have a whole new website. I think what's fascinating is we did this whole project before the internet, cell phones. We just put up signs and got hundreds of people at meetings uh, to join up and be a part of it. So uh, I think what we are looking for through the papers and stuff, I, it was really nice that we did a Brick Bottom Speaks uh, <coughs> recently for our 30th anniversary and people told some old stories and Jacob Schick, I think, <coughs> he came and we didn't even know until after that he was at the meeting and we got a full page spread with my photo and two other people's photos on it. <laughs> so it was really, you know, a nice way to get press without even asking for it. Uh, we're not even sure how he found out about it because it's usually in-house. So he might have a friend there. I got on your list after meeting you two years ago. So yeah, okay. That's, that's okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's what we're looking for, more stuff about arts. I mean, someone mentioned earlier, there used to be the Phoenix, the real paper and stuff. That's all gone. Everything is on the internet now. you got to look up this, you got to look up that. Uh, I prefer holding uh, a piece of paper and reading it. And how shall I say, you can't always bring your computer into the restroom with you. <laughs> uh, there used to be art listings on these papers, you know, all the events, all the galleries that were open, all the music events. Now you got to go look and find out about things. Uh, so I think that's, you know, part of what we're looking for uh, through our gallery, which the, is, is, has, uh, oh, 10 shows. I think our gallery person is, wasn't here today, but she was planning on coming. Oh, Deb is there. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Uh, she's not, you're not sitting with us? You're sitting separately? Okay. Uh, but BAA, which is the Brick Bottom Artists Association, is a 5013C nonprofit. Uh, something we have to be a member of the BAA. You can be a resident there, you can be an artist, you can be a supporter. We also have a program that we're trying to spread the word about called Affiliate Artists. For actually, for our 30th year, it was $30. Now it's 50 back to the $50 a year. You become a member, an affiliate member. You're in two shows a year plus the open studios where you can exhibit in common spaces or in someone else's studio who has extra wall space. So that's a plus for other artists who are out there and want to get their work seen. And, uh, you know, I think part of what the concern is, a lot of the other spaces are... Uh, rentals and people are going to get evicted. I don't, know, uh, I don't know if Artist Asylum owns their space or not, but just as a quick example, then I'll close. Uh, several of us lived in the Fort and had studios in the Fort Point area. Uh, I was at 319A Street and I paid $3 a square foot for a studio space. Same building, the same floor, a 2,000 square foot space recently sold for over 
three million dollars. Uh, you know, and that well, that's what we don't want to happen here. Uh, you can afford it. <laughs> so, okay, that's it. I think. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Denise Provo, state rep for this district, and I was just planning on listening, but as I listened, I realized that I put out a regular electronic newsletter. Senator Jalen puts out a regular electronic newsletter, and I'm sure a lot of the city councilors in Somerville do the same. Uh, and, you know, I don't pretend to be a journalist. However, I'm very clear about my point of view. And I use a lot of data and I put in links so that you can go to my original sources so, you know, we can have a discussion about the merits. My latest newsletter included an article about MBTA's proposed fare increase, which uh, affects everybody in Somerville and which, among other things, is racist <laughs> uh, because it has a disparate impact, uh, whether it's intended to be racist or not. Uh, and, and an article about how the way the state reports data uh, undercounts homeless people in a way which is misleading and confusing. So um, that's an example of what you can get if you go to the newsletters of your elected officials. Um, if you go to deniseprovo.org, you can sign up for mine. I'm sure Senator Jalen's website has a similar thing. But look around um, and you know, the, if you go to websites of elected officials who you want to hear from, you'll probably be able to figure out how to get news from them, too. Thanks. My name is Suzanne Bremer. I'm a long-term Somerville resident. I've been active in the community, and I've spent my professional life at the intersection of people, information, and technology. In other words, I'm a librarian. <clears throat> a more modern take on the word librarian and on the, and on the profession is information scientist. And as a scientist, I, and a number of the people in this room who have helped me, um, we took a look at this problem of information and what's going on. And I find the phrase, Info, no, news desert, I, I find it uh, inadequate mm -hmm. to how I experience news as a consumer. My personal experience is I am inundated, overflowing tsunami level um, of information coming at me all the time. And I'm old enough to remember when you had a telephone that hung on the wall and you dialed it, and you had your best friend and you wrote their name down in a little book that you carried, and it was, because I'm a librarian, it was in alphabetical order. Um, and I remember that the way you got the news was in a newspaper, or a Time magazine, or Walter Cronkite. <laughs> and the great thing about this is someone was curating our news, right? Somebody went out and they took things that were happening in their community, and they wrote about it so that I could, didn't have to read the 400-page con congressional report. Somebody else went, they wrote an article, they were trained professional journalism, so they knew what they were doing, they were paid for what they do, and then somebody else came along and aggregated their work, whether it's Dig Boston or the New York Times or whatever, and then I, as the consumer, this is how, one of the ways I got my news. Well, we all know this changed everything. So what I did with a bunch of my colleagues in the room, and I'll introduce them in a minute, is we started an experiment. And we took as our premise that we are the media. We create content. We post on Facebook, we got Instagram, we have our blogs, we have our you know, we, we are generating media. What we don't have is an aggregator that moderates the forum and, and, and seeks out information. We, as a community, don't own what conceptually is a printing press. So, because we're scientists, we experimented. 
And we ran up against a couple of things. One is we figured out we had to define our mission because it became very, it came clear very quickly that everybody wants a seat at the table, and which is great. But you find that some people don't want to sit at the table with other people, and they get all mm. so we had to come up with some guidelines. So we started with a mission statement, and we go from there. So now we're in the process of forming um, an editorial policy. So we're in the process of creating the structure, um, and I'm going to cut to the chase. So everybody, pick out your take out your phone. Take out your phone and go to your search engine and Google or Bing or whatever you use. Bing? Nobody uses Bing. <laughs> my brother worked for Microsoft. <laughs> it paid the mortgage. I want to that for And search for Somerville Free Press and you'll see what, we're, what we've been up to, which is great. Now, my friend Chris here, everyone who's worked on the Somerville Free Press, stand up, please. <coughs> my friend Andre. Mary, you're here, you've been published. Al, uh, Matt's been published, Roberta is our proofreader. Thank you, Roberta, for saving us from um, some man-made disasters, or Suzanne-made disasters. Um, um, and so these are the folks that if you look at our website, you will find their articles of examples of content that we as members of the community have created. Now to bridge the gap, because of this, I talked about the tsunami and all of the information that's out there, we don't have an aggregator, and we don't have a way to get from how do we narrow it down from all the stuff that's available to our phone to what's of interest just to us in Somerville. And this is where the newspaper model comes in. If we took a sheet of paper and put it in the beauty shops and the coffee shops all over Somerville with QR codes that link to in-depth reporting, we could have a way of combining what's the best about a newspaper with what's best about the huge amount of, of, of technology that we can use to curate and tell our own story. So I'm gonna be around afterwards, um, so please um, come see me and I will, uh, 10 seconds, I'm, I'm under the wire, that's great. Um, <laughs> oh no, okay, I'm, I, all right, I got the hook. We're letting you write, yeah, go for it. Yeah, me. thank you, no, anyway, I'm here afterwards, so please see me, um, and I'm happy to talk about this project and my colleagues will be there also, so thank you very much. Theater at First, my name is Joe Guthrie, I'm the Vice President of Theater at First. Who are we? We are Somerville's community theater. We are 100% volunteer run. We are based out of Davis Square, and the reason I have notes is because I will talk your ear off, so let's start here. All right, uh, things we need. I'm looking at the things that we were sent. It was like, what are the things that are important to you? What are the things you need? We need media coverage. Yay, come talk to me. I believe I have in mind Bill and... <laughs> Greg and Lynn, hi, I'm going to find you. Um, we could use some help finding grants so that we can share some of the amazing things we do. Um, in general, let me specify, Somerville needs more affordable rehearsal and performance spaces yeah. that are handicap accessible. Yeah. Um, we also need affordable and accessible outdoor productions, which can include outdoor bathrooms. Actually, that's one of the problems we have. We, can, we have a lot of folks who are interested in doing outdoor performances, but nowhere for our audiences to pee. Mm. <clears throat> Why? Um, theater can entertain you, can bring you to tears, can help process controversial op uh, topics, and can provide you with different points of view. Um, our next show, uh, which you should all know about and come to, is by a local playwright. Her name is Ginger Lazarus, and it's called Burning. Um, we'd love your help to talk about this dramatic modern-day nod to Cyrano de Bergerac of love under the don't tell, don't, a don't, uh, don't ask, a don't tell um, in the U.S. military. It's uh, going to be really interesting, and it's one of the many different types of things we do. Um, we have a number of different productions. We've got four main stage productions, more or less, that we do every year. We've got three staged readings that we do. We've got two, yes, there's a theme here. Um, ah, we do, oh, through our Giving It First series, we have two fundraisers that we do. We just did a 24-hour festival wherein we raised over $1,000 for Parkinson's. 
so rock on. We've worked with a number of Somerville organizations um, as well. We've worked with um, BRCC. We've worked with Teen Empowerment. Um, and we love Artisans Asylum because y'all are awesome at making LED lights and birthday cakes. Uh, among other things, we have a number of friends who are there. Uh, so shout out to that. And I'd like to do a shout out to the Post Meridian Radio Players, who are our sister company. You're going to hear from them next. Or soon, anyway. And uh, we do all these cool things because of the passionate people in this community. With a bit of luck and a whole lot of hard work, we have lasted for 15 years. What started as my best friend turning to me and saying, hey, I want to direct my husband and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. You want to come be the TD? I'm like, I haven't done that since college. Are you kidding, lady? She's like, oh, come on, it'll be fun. Instead of going on vacation, we're going to spend the money on this. All right. And then we had fun. And then we had another show, and we had fun. And then we had another show. And now 15 years later, I'm the vice president of a 501c3 that's based out of Somerville, which is an awesome community. And we want more of you to audition and be our audience members. So come. Check out our website, theateratfirst.org. You can spell theater with an R-E or an E-R. Um, and you can check out our mission statement there. You can check out more information about us there. Uh, if you are a webmaster, we could always use some help there. Um, <laughs> and we would love to see you. Please come and please talk to me. I would love to tell you more wonderful stories about families and things. Right, so, uh, first off, I'd like to thank everyone who spoke before me. I'd like to thank all of you here. My name is Guillermo Hamlin. I am the vice president of the board directors at Somerville Media Center formerly SCAT TV, and we'd like to thank each and every one of you for using your voice. I'm about to ask you to do something that's just one step further, and that is consider joining the Somerville Media Center, and here's why. You're already trying to get the word out, and in some ways, I feel like I've seen a lot of you at the Somerville Media Center. If you can indulge me real quick, if you've been interviewed by SCAT TV, if you've been, uh, if you've been interviewed by SCAT TV, if you've been on Boston Free Radio, our online radio and podcasting studio, if we've written about you at Somerville Neighborhood News, or if you've been on Somerville Neighborhood, uh, Somerville Neighborhood News, if you've been interviewed by Joe Lynch, please stand up. All right. Pre predominantly here, I see. So to this section of the room and to each and every one of you and to everyone at home, I'd like to make an ask to join our membership at Somerville Media Center because if we want to get the word out, I'm confident you're going to need some video equipment to get there. And quite frankly, because we have a lot of written word, I'm a big fan of Somerville Free Press. Uh, Susan, actually got, uh, Susan actually got an article for you finally. And, but most importantly, we could use your support. The FCC, per usual, is playing games. They're trying to diminish our capacity to tell you what's going on in city council meetings when schools are closing, or just those weird shows at midnight that you'd like to watch when you're returning home from a late night out in Somerville. But we could do it better. We can amplify your concerns and your voices better if you utilize the equipment that's available to you. Now, you're saying like, oh, I don't know, that sounds like money talk. It's a little money talk. Because for an individual membership, it's like $50 a year. What does that sound like? That's less than $4 a month. Don't live in Somerville? Guess what? That's 60 a year. That's five a month. And you have all these benefits afforded to you, as well as the great community that we already share. The only thing that we get to add is the megaphone that allows you to get every single one of your concerns out there faster and louder. Thank you so much. And one last thing, since you're already here, down the street, we are actually commemorating our members at a gala. We're doing an SMC Honors Gala, and it's going to be up the street. It's going to be at uh, Friday, March 8th, at the Center for the Arts and Armory, 199 Highland Ave. If you can come, that's great. I would just love to see each and every one of you return to the megaphone that is Somerville Media Center to get all this shit out. We need to get this out. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for being here. I'm uh, Jay Sakura. I'm uh, here with the Post Meridian Radio Players, PMRP.org. And um, I'd like uh, Michael Lynn and Mayor Freed also to stand up and wave your hands. You can talk to them, too. Um, and uh, we are a 
live staged uh, radio drama group. Um, we're a sibling organization to theater at first, uh, but instead of fully staged stuff, it's people at microphones, um, often in costume. Um, and uh, we do have some uh, studio-only recordings, uh, but mostly it's performances, and we do record our performances as well. Um, and to give you an idea of what sorts of shows we've done, we do a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories. We do a lot of uh, Edgar Allan Poe adaptations. Uh, we've done Alice in Wonderland. Uh, we've done an adaptation of Night of the Living Dead. Um, and we have an adaptation coming up of a 1915 silent film, uh, Philibus the Mysterious Sky Pirate, translated for radio drama, and uh, also the true life story of uh, Kate Warren, the first female Pinkerton officer. Um, so what are we looking for from the media landscape? Well, obviously, we're looking for publicity, not just uh, to get audiences to our performances, but also to get uh, um, people to our auditions and to get uh, proposals submitted and scripts submitted and stuff like that. Um, and that's not as important in the grand scheme of things as poverty and affordable housing and equitable development and stuff like that. But we are affected by the same changes in the media landscape that are affecting you know, everyone in this room. Um, so uh, for instance, I mean, there's obviously lots of really good local reporting. But overall, uh, as newspapers consolidate, and there are fewer and fewer of them, and they're more uh, centralized and nationally oriented, um, it's, uh, it's harder for independent voices to get out, and it's harder for us to get in touch with our neighbors. Um, I mean, and also as people's attention gets more focused on uh, online forums and places that might be echo chambers where you already have like-minded people and that are not geographically organized, it's often easier for us to communicate with radio theater aficionados in uh, the Twin Cities or uh, California than it is for our, to communicate with our neighbors who can actually come to our shows and who we want to serve. And it's easy for us to reach people who are our friends or who are interested in the same things that we are and look like the people already in, in the organization, and harder for us to reach people who uh, look and think and feel like a representative of uh, Somerville the community that we want to serve. Um, so uh, great. Um, so I, uh, uh, again, talk to me or Mayor or Michael. And uh, we would love to talk to you about more about our shows. And we would love to collaborate in replicating the sort of locally focused uh, media environment and channels to reach our neighbors that, uh, you know, small town newspapers once provided. Thank you all very much. Uh, my name is Lee, and um, uh, first, I guess for transparency's sake, I will tell you that I am a resident of Cambridge. So I had to move to Cambridge in order to afford to stay close to Davis Square, and um, I find that amusing and like to lift that up as often as possible. Um, so actually, it's a good segue into uh, some of the things I wanted to just bring up today. Um, also, just uh, some affiliations, uh, different groups I'm connected to in the city. Uh, Climate Coalition of Summerville, which we have a rep here who's going to speak a little bit more about some of the things we lift up as an organization and would like to um, see some coverage on. Um, Somerville Climate Action and Somerville Interfaith. Um, but yeah, so again, speaking to, again, the issue of displacement in the city. Um, so one, just wanted say thank you again to people who have already brought this up. Bill, I know you had uh, put it very eloquently earlier. Um, wanted to raise it up again, though. I think also in the context of like, who's being displaced, how many people are already gone, what, were the, what did the city look like in 2010, 2012, the different communities that were here, individuals, groups. Like I don't really have a good sense of, of all that information. And 
so I just I would wonder what role um, the local media can play in really helping to, for lack of a better term, establish some of those baselines. So who are the communities? Um, you know, how much the community if each of these communities is already gone since when? Why are they leaving? So again, is it things related to increases in rent? Um, development uh, over time. We're also going to see potentially with climate change and extreme weather events, right, how that's going to also change that. So I think it's the role that you can play to establish some of that information now and then be watching that for the community over time and, and sharing it would be awesome. Um, another way to do that too would be through storytelling. Some of the long-term residents here, um, what are some of the bears they may be facing to potentially stay here? So I think being able to lift that up. Um, so again, who's intentionally measuring some of these changes in demographics over time? Uh, a couple of different happenings that I know you also asked about. Uh, one of the things that we support are uh, there's something called depavings. I don't. I'm curious who. When I even say the word depaving, if people are like, "What the heck is she talking about?" Yeah. Um, so depavings um, is an initiative that was actually in, um, through Somerville Climate Action. A couple of different organizers who just basically. Um, helps support residents who want to lift up the pavement in their yard and put in green spaces. And so uh, there's a couple done every year. The, we're at a point right now where there's some conversations, I think, with the city and some, um, and some other different, uh, some other residents and environmental groups to really build out that program. And a great way to do that, both on the supply and demand side, I think, would be through media coverage. Um, we, uh, you know, so we're going to along the same line of like climate resilience, uh, we also are continue to have different like climate socials and create spaces where ideally we'd be finding some of the intersections between climate justice, arts, music, and so um, that could be something we continue to talk about as well. I also would like to just lift up um, the issue of environmental justice. So there obviously are specific issues that have been brought up. I think someone said about air and noise pollution, um, but I would wonder again through that, it, the role that, um, how do I say it? The role that local media can play, and I guess in really just applying that environmental justice lens to your work. Um, and so, again, whether the issue is air pollution or access to green space, some suggestions would be maybe lifting up each of these issues, and what does that look like here in Somerville? So what's the issue? What is the context surrounding it? Who are the impacted individuals and communities? Who are the individuals and communities and groups who are helping to respond to those particular justice issues? And um, one last part of that, too, I would like to just uh, lift up um, is the importance of moving away from well, a lot of people might call it the white savior complex. So who are people within the impacted communities and who are the individuals um, who are working within the communities to make, to make those changes and to respond? So really lifting it up so that, one, people are seeing uh, people not as victims, right? So how can we really be empowering each other and supporting each other? And so that people within the communities are also seeing people that look like them doing this kind of work. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Hi, so my name's Maury. I'm from West Medford, but I actually live on the Tufts campus now. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Hi, I'm Anne Marie. I'm also a Tufts student, and I use they and she series pronouns. We're here with Tufts Housing League, along with these other excellent folks sitting in this row here, if you all want to give a wave, other Tufts Housing League folks. Um, and we're actually here because housing, while our group is called Tufts Housing League, is obviously relevant to all of us. And something that some other people have touched on already today, but that we want to really emphasize, is the fact that Somerville is in a housing crisis. Right now, like it's not just like, oh, housing, rent's getting higher, like crisis. Like there's over 2,000 students have to push Somerville and Medford residents out every single year because they can't find housing on campus. This like only adds to increased rents and like landlord collaboration in ways that are kind of skeevy and not so nice to make rents like $1,000 for a room right off of Tufts campus, which is more expensive than like Manhattan and Brooklyn, so what's up? <laughs> Do you want to take some Sure, points? yeah. Um, so Tufts Housing League is a radical student-run organization on campus that was founded just last year, but since then we've had a really successful push and campaign with a March Rally Day of Action that had over 200 students, hourly programming, 11 different speakers last November, right? So we've been doing a lot of pushing and having lots of really difficult conversations with administration, kind of saying, hey, why aren't you building a new high-density dorm on campus, right? We needed that 10 years ago. 
you know, what gives? Um, so we're here not just to coalition build a network with journalists, because this is really a point at which we really need to rally around. We really want to talk to other housing-related community organizations that are here. So please come and find us. Um, right now, we're working on an on and off campus housing guide for students, uh, because Tufts isn't giving us the information that we need. So we're really working along with other students uh, to create the information that we need. Uh, but we are on the side of right community members. We're all fighting the same battle. We all want accessible, affordable housing. So like, please come and talk with us, because we need media coverage, not just to you know pressure Tufts and kind of you know make Tufts realize that it needs to like get off its butt and do some things, but also to really highlight and show community members that students are on the same side as you. Right. We're also here uplift. Uh, we've been helping a little bit uplifting like the pilot negotiations that go on between the university and the community mm -hmm. because a lot of the time like students can have some more leverage to try to be like, hey Tufts, like actually boop, boop, pay attention, and then the community members have leverage to be like Tufts, you're not living up to your responsibilities as a giant, giant, giant nonprofit taking up so many resources. Mm -hmm. So we're just really here trying to like work together as community members and media team people and students to all just like find our common ground on like what's important to people, which is shelter. Right, and it's not just Tufts, right? Wealth polarization is happening in Somerville and Boston and Tufts is just a mirror and reflection of that. Um, so we sit within a larger context of wealth inequality and displacement, uh, which is why even though we're Tufts students, right, Tufts isn't a bubble. We live within the context of Somerville and Medford. Um, so just to, to summarize also, um, as a little helpful plug. Um, we have literature, we have handouts over here. Um, we also have buttons. Um, but finally, one thing that we really stress in Tufts Housing League is transparency, right? Tufts doesn't release a lot of documentation and data. And if you come and network with us, we actually have a publicly accessible Google Drive folder that has not just our correspondence and emails with administration, but the documents and data that we've gotten from them loosely termed documents and data, um, our own manipulations and working with that data so you can see just exactly what it's saying, um, as well as the trove of different sort of op-eds and publicly uh, released statements that we made over the past year. So either talk to us or we'll be posting that from our social media, Tufts Housing League on Facebook and on Instagram. Thank you guys so much. Woo, thanks. Hi, I'm Renee Scott. I live on Boston Street in Somerville. I am here, um, I'm a green, summer, green and open Somerville um, co-founder, but I'm here representing the Climate Coalition of Somerville. Um, I'm, we are a coalition of advocacy and activist groups collectively invested in driving environmental sustainability in Somerville. And there are some other members who have or hopefully will be speaking. Here are just a few of the issues we'd like to get some more attention. In 2014, Somerville was among the first cities in the country to set the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. What has the city achieved since then and what big decisions still need to be made? The parts of the city most vulnerable to flooding from the bigger storms we expect in the future happen to be the neighborhoods that are seeing the biggest developments. It's too late to build a resilient assembly square, and it might be too late for a resilient union square. Can Brick Bottom and Boynton Yards be developed with more forethought? Did you know that the infill and plastic blades of artificial turf fields migrate into the surrounding landscape and waterways and are microplastics by size, but we do nothing to prevent this pollution? The city's proposed new zoning code is an important tool that will incentivize builders to construct more sustainable buildings using techniques such as the passive housing standard. Several developers have taken note and presented sustainable buildings to the public, but the state's Board of Building Standards and Regulations holds the real key to sustainable buildings through the building code and will be instrumental not only to whether Somerville achieves carbon neutrality, but also whether the state can fulfill its obligations under the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008. Somerville currently has over 200 active gas leaks, which continuously emit methane and toxic chemicals found in fracked gas. They pose a public health and safety threat because of the risk of explosions. There's minimal accountability, and the State Department of Public Utilities gives utilities no incentives to address the issues of leaking infrastructure. Somerville is the least green city in the state. There is a direct correlation with lack of green space and the heat island effect, and we need to be adding more green spaces, not removing them. In Union Square on the D2 block, there is an opportunity to increase the green space significantly, significantly over what the developer is proposing, but it is getting little traction. We are so intent on development that we are ignoring that we have displaced untold native flora and fauna that are vital parts of a healthy ecosystem and the key to a healthy future. There is an epidemic of the slaughter of trees happening right now. To end on an upbeat note, 
There is a, sustain a sustainability tour being planned for Sunday, April 28th during the city's annual Sustainable Week. Residents will showcase where they are on their sustainability journeys and talk about their experiences lowering their carbon footprints and making their properties more climate resilient. If you want to reach us to talk about these or any other uh, issues that we have, and there are tons, this is just a, a drop in the bucket of the issues that all of our groups are working on, um, you can email us at climatecoalitionofsomerville at gmail.com. That's again, climatecoalitionofsomerville at gmail.com, and we will make sure that you get um, in touch with the right group. Thank you. I'm Matt LaValle, and I live on Warren Avenue down the street here. I do some work for the Somerville Free Press with Suzanne over there. I also, as a hobby, like live tweet uh, city council meetings, which is interesting if you're interested in that. I'm also not the only person in this room who does that, and the other party may identify his or herself. Uh, that's Chris. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm also a guy that really likes spreadsheets, and in that capacity, I'm here to give everybody, uh, to offer everybody a resource that I've been working on, which is that I've been doing a deep dive into campaign finance of our mayor, Joe Curtitone. And so I basically downloaded uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole database of uh, contributions to Curtitone campaigns since 2010, which is something that anybody can get from the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, but the data that's in it is wicked sloppy. So I've been for the last month or so looking through to find all the connections between different people and parties, fix everybody's like misspellings of their own names that's in there, find out like who is whose mother-in-law, you know, and uh, a lot of people, there's a lot of cases where an executive from some company or other will give $1,000 to the mayor and then several people with the same name and address will also give a lot of money to the mayor on the same day which is not illegal, but it does make you wonder. Uh, so there's, like, there's two reasons why you might want this information. One of them is if you don't care about campaign finance, but you are in the market for an out-of-town, well-moneyed uh, developer of real estate, a management company for apartments, uh, somebody who owns a lot, of, uh, a lot of real estate around town, if you're interested in you know, some heavy equipment rentals, somebody put up a fence, construction firms of all sorts, one very generous defense contractor based in Somerville, uh, or the Herb Chambers Auto Group who give that dude a ton of money. Um, another reason is if you think that the office of the mayor and boards appointed by the mayor are people in a unique position of power to mediate the relationship between for-profit companies and developers and the built environment and political environment in which we live in the city, you might be really interested in who it is that sees fit to give this mayor one or two hundred thousand dollars a year to run generally with no opponent. So if you want all this data, it lives on a cloud <laughs> and I can share it with you. Uh, come find me after we're all done talking or strange but true at gmail is my email address and I will give you all my work absolutely for free. Thank you. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Bill White. I'm an at-large city councilor. I see a lot of friendly and familiar faces here. Um, I wasn't gonna speak originally, but I shared some of my thoughts with folks at the front desk. And I think it's important because I see a lot of, again, the old established activists and a lot of new folks. And what I've seen take place, especially because of the media, causes me great concern. And let me tell you what, when I started out, there was print journalism. You would have one, you know, there was one real newspaper, I don't want to say real, one newspaper of record for the city of Somerville that pretty much everybody read. And why was that? It cross-pollinated, and that's something to think about. So if someone had a kid in the Little League, they'd get the paper to see the Little League score, but they'd also read the other things. So back then, if you had something like the Climate Action, an article on that, people might say, gee, you know, we really have a problem what's happening with the climate. Or if somebody got it because of a high school graduation and there was an article in gender equity, that would affect them. So think about a million different articles and, and people who might have an interest in one thing learning about another. That doesn't take place from what I can see very much. A lot of things are departmentalized, so folks have newsletters or Facebook pages, et cetera that are specific to one thing. Now, one of the benefits when you had a newspaper of record that maybe 10,000 people would read as an elected official, let's say I had a brother and sister that were on the city payroll and I voted 100% for the mayor. Needless to say, there would probably be an editorial on that and probably people would look down at me as I shopped in a store or whatever. 
you don't have that right now. So what I think is very important, as, as I see specialized activists and folks here from the media, is to try to cross-pollinate. If you have an area of interest, and let's say it's just the arts, for instance, but there's a real concern about development in Union Square, maybe instead of putting an article about the arts and some of you put an article about development in Union Square or development citywide, because it is going to have an impact on the arts community. So my fear is, again, we're getting a bit, as an elected official, too much compartmentalized and really try to reach out. That could be both the activists in the community, I know climate action or green open. If there's an issue on something else, let's say gender equity, you, you put that in your newsletter or something. So folks who might be reading us, you know, and there's a link or whatever, they get energized to participate in that because this community really is changing. Um, one of the things is most of the housing is largely owned in two and three family homes that used to be owner occupied. Now, of course, a lot, it doesn't mean 100% owner occupied or 100% absentee landlord are different um, necessarily, but when you have a lot of home ownership, people necessarily aren't interested in gouging for rent and such. But every year, more and more homes are turning over to absentee landlords. And if they're paying $1.2 million for a two or three family house, the rents that they're going to charge is going to price everybody out. So as we move forward, especially at the city council with a lot of the decisions we're going to make, it's going to be important for a cross-pollinization of all impacted folks to get together to play a role in how this city moves forward. Thank you all for coming. My name is Nathan. Uh, I'm resident of Somerville and a recent graduate of Tufts University, and I'm here to talk about the Sack Sackler Coalition. So the Sackler, the Sackler family are the billionaire owners of OxyContin. They made lots and lots of money off of OxyContin while systematically lying about, it, lying about its effects, um, aggressively pursuing sales tactics with doctors to push higher doses and more pills on people who didn't need them. And they also are heavy donors to Tufts University. Uh, the Sackler School for Biomedical Sciences is named after them and they founded the Tufts Pain Management Program. They, didn't, they, did, this, they did this in order to spread pro-opioid propaganda, more or less, into the medical community. So there are things like the Sacklers um, placed unlabeled curriculum materials in the pain management program. Um, they got the head of the pain management program to testify in favor of OxyContin to the FDA. They've been in communication with our, our, our lovely president. And just in general, there are all these connections, and there is a need for us as the Tufts community, as the Somerville community, all of us have uh, ownership of this, and we need to do something to change these connections to the Sacklers to repudiate uh, their influence on Tufts and to make sure that something like this doesn't happen in the future and to make sure that they can no longer get um, credibility and name recognition from their connection to Tufts University. So going forward, we're going to be networking a lot with the community. We're going to be starting to take action, potentially um, reaching out and becoming a lot more public. And I would love to connect with people in the community, with journalists, to talk about what to do going forward and what we're going to do. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ruth Farris, and I'm on the board of the Center for Arabic Culture, which is a small, small nonprofit. We have offices right in the armory. And let's face it, if anyone needs any good press, it's Arabs. Um, and that specifically, we are, in our charter, a cultural arts organization. We take no position on poli um, politics or religion. Um, and we're pretty unique in that way. Most Arab organizations are sort of based in a church or, or a mosque. So what we do is we have one of our biggest things is a large Arabic school that runs actually in Newton at Brimmer in May, but for adults and children to learn Arabic. Uh, we run a lot of programs here in this, uh, right at the armory. We had recently a big calligraphy workshop. We do um, uh, foreign films, Arab films. We've participated with Nibble in doing an Arabic cooking class. And um, we do it because we love our culture and we want to keep our culture for our children to enjoy. And also because we don't want non-Arabs to be afraid of us. We want people to learn about the beauty of our culture and to counter some of the negative things that go on in the press. So I'm not able to stay for the networking, but I would love to talk to anybody who would like to hear more about our programs and feature us sometime. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say this meeting fully encompasses why I love being in Somerville, and I feel so incredibly fortunate that my husband and I were able to buy a house here in 99, number one, because I thought we were going to 
um, end up losing everything because the market was going up and we thought it was going to crash and everything was going to be horrible. But that's also why um, my, and also no one in my family had ever owned a home before, so it was a, a double win there. It's also why I would love for my brother, who lives in Somerville, to be able to stay in Somerville, but he has been renting a room in Union Square for 10 years. He's about to be kicked out because it's really expensive. And so everything everybody's talking here just completely fully encapsulates our situation where I own a home. I'm incredibly fortunate for that reason. I want him to stay. So I'm going to be leaving here to look at a property to buy that's kind of close to Tufts. But according to our calculations, in order to pay the mortgage, we'd have to charge about $800 a room. And he live in the basement and be the caretaker just so my brother can not have to move to Lowell um, or Malden or go back to Omaha, which is where we're originally from. So, you know, these, it, it just fully encapsulates everything. So I made my list, you know, other things that I'd like um, the media to cover are surge pricing for Uber and Lyft, because my brother drives for Lyft, and a lot of times he gets a message saying, surge pricing, surge pricing, and he goes out there, and then he sits and waits for 45 minutes um, for a ride, and of course he's not paid for the time that he's waiting for a ride. He doesn't get paid until the person actually gets in the car. So, you know, so I really think there's an investigation there, which is, are people paying for surge pricing that the drivers are not getting? You know, how does all of that work? But as I'm sitting here saying, oh, I want a story about this and I want a story about that, it occurred to me, Chris, I've admired the work that you've been doing for years and years and years. I don't think I'm actually giving money to help you pay for you to buy the flashlight to go down to the basement and explore all the nooks and crannies down there. So my pledge today is I'm going to just finally get to joining the Somerville Media <laughs> um, um, Center and I'm going to you know, just take a pledge that I'm going to start, um, you know, buy a subscription or I'm going to donate or I'm going to buy an ad or something like that to help support the media because we want all these stories. but we have to put our money. And for those of you who are already doing so much for this community, um, that's your time. For some of us who don't have enough money, then we probably know people who do have money, so just you know, tell them, oh, I bought a subscription, you should too. <laughs> don't tell them you can't afford it. So anyway, so I just wanted to get up here and say that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Ulysses Latiner. I've been a Somerville resident for about 18 years. I'm on the steering committee of Indivisible Somerville and also uh, Davis Now, which is a uh, community pressure group that's working to get the administration to make Davis Square look a bit less like Times Square in the 1980s. Um, but I'm not actually here in any of those capacities today. I'm just here today as a Somerville resident with some opinions. And the first opinion is um, Chris and Renee mentioned the whole tree crisis that we have in Somerville. Um, but this isn't just a Somerville crisis. This is like a regional thing. Um, in Cambridge, you know, right now in the last couple of weeks, there was like, there's this huge ongoing outrage out uh, near Alewife, I think it is, what is it, Wheeler Street, does that sound right? Um, where they're like, uh, this developer's gonna cut down like hundreds of, you know, mature old growth trees uh, to expand like an underground parking garage, I think it is. Um, and then also like there's the Harvard Square Divinity School Oak, which if you're in this room and you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, just Google Harvard Square Divinity School Oak, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so there's like, this is not just a Somerville thing, it's a big regional thing. And I think uh, someone earlier mentioned the idea of connecting the dots. Like the media, if the media can help the people of Cambridge, Somerville, probably Medford too, for all I know, connect the dots on what's going on here. It's a much, it's like a big story on the local level and like the work that uh, Renee and uh, Chris and uh, Councillor Scott are doing to like fight back against this and like arrest it, that's huge. But it's not just big here, it's like big, big, big on like the, you know, sort of like wider, like, uh, the network of like Somerville, Cambridge and like neighboring communities. Um, and I think if people, it needs, the story needs to get out there a bit more so that people can put together, hey, this isn't just us getting our trees chopped down. It's like gone on everywhere. And if we actually band together, nobody actually wants this widespread, you know, tree slaughter. It's just the developers who benefit from this. Most people actually like trees. And if the media helps sort of connect the dots, I think people will realize they have a lot more power to, you know, speak up and maybe fight back against this than they currently probably think they do. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was um, the question of the MBTA fair increase. Like everyone knows about that. That's like a big public thing that the MBTA is like publicly calling for comment on this. Um, so I feel like the media has done a pretty good job of covering that. And again, this isn't necessarily a local thing. This is actually a big regional story, but the story needs to get out more like on every level because what I didn't know 
and I'm glad most people are sitting in here because you definitely want to be sitting on, on this. Um, I actually, so I obsessively read like all the newsletters I'm subscribed to from like elected representatives. My wife obsessively consumes like all of the, uh, you know, uh, news outlets, both uh, local, regional, national. And neither of us knew until Representative Provo's newsletter uh, put this in, on, in front of my eyes on like Thursday or Friday of this week that the MBTA fair hike is going to increase their annual revenue from like $710 million a year to like $740 million a year. So it's like a $30 million increase. Meanwhile, the MBTA also is, has given a contract to a private company to requisition a new fair in collection system that's going to cost $700 million. I don't know about you all, but I feel like the MBTA's fair swiping thing, it, it works. Do I need seven, do I need three quarters of a billion dollars of fair money that I'm a payee into being spent on getting a new card swipe mechanism? No. Like, what? Get rid of the fairs but, altogether. But nobody even knew, I, I didn't know about this until Representative Provo, whose newsletter is amazing, uh, Senator Jalen's newsletter is amazing. Um, like, if it weren't for that, like, how did my wife and I, who both read everything, how did we not know this was happening? So media, please pick that one up. Spread that far and wide and let people know that three quarters of a billion dollars are of, of the fare increase that is currently in the news. People don't know that that money is all, it's not going to be spent on making the tea suck less. It's not going to be spent on making the tea serve more areas. Like a whole year's worth of fares are going to go to make it so that you swipe your card slightly differently. It's ridiculous. That's all. <laughs> all right. On that note, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. Somerville is awesome. You did great.